Good afternoon, my name is Bruce Goldberger, G-O-L-D-B-E-R-G-E-R. -E -E may, you may proceed. Sir, how are you employed? I'm a professor and director of toxicology at the University of Florida, College of Medicine in the Departments of Pathology and Psychiatry. Right. Could you just give us a quick thumbnail sketch of your educational background? I have a BA degree in zoology and MS and PhD degrees in forensic toxicology. Uh, what is forensic toxicology? Forensic toxicology is the application of toxicology for the purpose of the law. So the majority of the work that I do involves medical legal toxicology workup of cases. Does that involve testing various uh, body fluids or, or body substances for the presence of volatile compounds? Yes. As a matter of fact, at the university, we work about 3,000 cases per year. And just about every single case is subjected to tests that would routinely detect volatile substances. Now, um, are you routinely contacted by a med medical examiner's office around, around the state in order to uh, analyze uh, samples from various forensic cases? Yes. Back in December of 2008, were you contacted by Dr. Garavaglia of the District 9 Medical Examiner's Office in reference to the remains of a child that was later identified as Kaylee Anthony? Yes, I was. Did you actually travel from your office in Gainesville to Orlando to take some samples from the remains? Yes, I did. What type of samples did you take? I was working with uh, Dr. Garavaglia that day that I went to the, the medical examiner's office in Orlando and uh, collected a series of samples which included uh, a small piece of the left femur, some marrow from the left femur. We prepared uh, washes using a saline, which is a liquid, salty liquid, from the cranial cavity, and there were two of those washes. I also collected strands of hair some matted hair and so Excuse me, Dr. Goldberg. We have Hello. an objection and would like to go sidebar. If you may. You may proceed. Thank you. I believe you ended us, uh, the last thing you mentioned was the cranial washes with saline. Uh, were there any other items after that? Yes, there were three. Strands of hair, some matted hair, and soil from the matted hair. Now, were all of these items tested for the presence of uh, volatile compounds? Uh, some, not all. Some were. All right. Specifically with reference at this point to the, uh, the cranial washes. First of all, how, how is that done? Describe very briefly how you did it. Well, we detect the volatile substances by really two techniques. One is uh, automated headspace gas chromatography method. Let, let me stop for a second. What I meant was how you actually physically collect the sample. In other words, describe what you did with the skull. That's, that's oh. what I'm concerned about. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, well, I was in the, the autopsy, autopsy room with Dr. Garavaglia, and um, we sealed the sutures of the skull, of the cranium, with uh, a waxy material called parafilm. And then we added saline, uh, 30 milliliters of saline to the cranium, and we shook it, and then we poured the saline into tubes, and we did that twice. All right. Now, when you got those tubes back to your laboratory, did you uh, run an analysis of the saline washes? Yes. And did you find anything in those washes that would indicate that any residue within the skull was residue of decomposition of the brain? Nothing was detected that would suggest decomposition product in the brain or in the cavity. In the skull cavity itself? Yes. No further questions. Cross-examination. Uh, I just want to clarify, I thought I heard you say something. Did you say that you collected uh, something from, uh, from the femur? Yes. Objection, Your Honor. Counsel indicated, uh, do I do anything else? This is what he had previously testified to. So if you something. open the door, he gets a chance to go into it. May we approach so I can explain what? Yeah, you can approach.
You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Dr. Goldberger, you collected bone marrow. I did. Okay. Now, when you when you uh, did the um, saline wash, that was somewhat of a uh, you did it somewhat of a crude type method while doing so. Correct. It's a technique I've used a number of times. It's crude, but it is what it is. It's just a wash of the cranial cavity with saline. And it wasn't exactly the best way of getting out what was inside of the skull, was it, sir? Uh, it's the best way I could without disturbing the structure of the cranium. Okay. Without opening the skull, it's the best way you had? Yes. Okay. And... Uh, when you mention products of decomposition, you're referring to a couple of chemicals that you normally look for in, in, in uh, decomposition. Yes, sir. And these products or items were not tested for DNA. Well, the, the chemicals that we look for don't have DNA per se. We're, we're looking for phenethyl amines. They're low molecular weight comp phenethyl amines, low molecular weight compounds. Uh, it's different than DNA. Right. And you're not a DNA analyst or, or anything like that? No, I'm not. Okay. And you did not send these samples for any further DNA analysis? Actually, you are beyond the witness's area of expertise. He's just indicating the samples can't render. Sustain. I just asked him, sir, if he sent them. Say sustain. Your Honor, may, may I approach? I, I, I think I need to clarify this issue. Sustain. Okay. Did you send them for any further testing anywhere else? No, I returned them to the medical examiner's office in Orlando. Thank you. No further questions. No further questions. May be excused, Your Honor. Yes, the witness may be excused. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll go ahead and begin, Judge. May I proceed? Just if you would reintroduce yourself to the jury. I know they met you a few weeks ago. I'm Dr. Michael Warren. I'm uh, director of the CA Pound Human Identification Laboratory at the University of Florida. Uh, I'm assistant uh, director of the William R. Maple Center for Forensic Medicine, and I'm in the Department of Anthropology. Uh, one other area of quali <coughs> qualifications I want to ask you about. Are you a member of any scientific working group in a particular field? Uh, yes, sir. And uh, juries, I think, heard this before, but briefly, what is a scientific working group? Okay. A scientific working group is uh, a group of uh, peers uh, that are generally tasked with uh, developing best practices uh, within a discipline. So all of the forensic sciences, DNA, trace, uh, anthropology, toxicology, all have scientific working groups. Uh, and it's basically to reach a consensus opinion in that discipline on how to do certain things. And are you a member of the scientific working group of anthropology or forensic anthropology, whichever it's called. Uh, anthropology, yes, anthropology. or SWIGANTH. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, the question, the single question I have to ask you about today is this. Is it considered, are you aware of any protocols which would require or recommend the um, opening of a skull for examination in a skeletal case? Objection, Your Honor. For an opinion outside of this witness's expertise. Overall. Yes, sir. Uh, no, sir. There is no protocol that I'm aware of. Is it uh, in your profession considered best practice to saw open a skull in a skeletal case? Uh, no, sir. Uh, th that, in fact, hasn't been uh, discussed among the scientific working group members or any other uh, groups that I'm aware of. And is there a reason, in your opinion, why opening or sawing open a skull in a skeletal case is n either one, not necessary, or two, a bad idea? Uh, it's not necessary. Uh, you can look through the bottom of the skull, which uh, there's a, a large hole called the foramen magnum uh, through which the spinal uh, cord passes. Uh, and you can see and, and also feel inside of the skull uh, the relevant anatomical structures that you're uh, concerned with. So uh, in the field of forensic anthropology, when we're presented with a human skull, there's really no uh, compelling reason to open that up unless there's something that you need to either photograph or there's something going on in the skull that you would like to further investigate. Uh, but in my opinion, you can adequately 
uh, examine a human skull without doing that. Um, and the negative consequences of that, I, I can think of two. One would be that uh, should another expert wish, should another expert uh, request to, uh, to review the first analyst's uh, opinions, uh, then uh, they would be unable to do so if you've altered the evidence. Uh, and, and then the second reason is I think it's probably unnecessarily invasive to, to, uh, to further damage the remains. All right. Now, are there instruments that would allow you to examine the skull through the, the frame? What's the word again? Uh, foramen magnum. Could you spell uh, that for the court reporter? Uh, yes, it's uh, foramen is F-O-R-M-A-I-N-A, -A, uh, which means whole and magnum. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, foramen, F-O-R-A-M-I-N. <laughs> It's like a spelling bee. Ma and magnum is? And magnum is M-A-G-N-U-M, uh, uh, which literally means large hole. All right. Yeah. Now, is there a way to, um, using some instrument, to thoroughly examine the interior of the skull through that frame, frame through that hole? Large hole. Through that large hole, um, even the parts that are sort of on the other side of it, is there some object you can use to do that? Certainly a, a dental mirror uh, or just a, a little... Uh, uh, mirror that you're able to adjust the, the end of that. So we typically would use a flashlight and look and, uh, and look at the, the base of the cranium, uh, what we would call the petrous portions of the, the temporal bone. All right. Um, now, presently in your laboratory, do you have a number of human skulls that are under examination? Yes, sir. And have you found it necessary to saw open uh, any of... Relevance. Overall. Have you found it necessary to saw open any of those skulls? Uh, none that are currently in the lab, no, sir. Is there a particular concern with skulls of children in, in doing that? Children's skulls are more fragile. Uh, the bones, uh, the, the sutures where the bones meet together uh, are, are, um, are open. They're not as interdigitated. They're not um, as, com as complex. They're still growing. So the, so the danger would be if you're sawing through a child's skull that, that you would create some fractures uh, in those thinner bones. At this time, Your Honor, I would like to show a witness and publish for the jury Defense is given for identification AZ, which is a blow up of defense exhibit in evidence 26. Objections. You may. Doctor, I'm going to show you this exhibit and, <clears throat> for the record, I indicate to you this is a photograph taken by a, a Dr. Spitz when he saw it open the skull. This fracture that we see in this photograph <clears throat> here. And well, here I'm sure. Uh, is that what you're what you're talking about? That that when you saw it open, the skull can actually fracture. Uh, let me get a little uh, closer to you there. I'm sorry. I'm going to make some dirt. Wait. See what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. I do. Okay. Is that what you're talking about? That the skull itself can <clears throat> fracture if you try to open it. It is. I examined the, the base of that uh, cranium, and that fracture was not there before. So, uh, so it's a new fracture. Okay. And that's one of the things you the contraindication. Or saw it open the skull. Yes, sir. Now, are you aware of any existing protocols uh, for the treatment of skeletal remains? Uh, for the treatment and examination of skeletal remains? Uh, the, the scientific working group has uh, published draft documents and some final documents online uh, for the forensic anthropology community. Uh, and do any of those documents uh, recommend uh, sawing open the skull for purposes of examination. No, Objection, sir. relevance as to what an anthropo uh, anthropo uh, anthropological uh, organization versus a forensic pathology organization, Judge. Overall, do any of those recommend sawing open the skull? No, sir. And are you uh, aware of a document known as the Minnesota Protocols issued by the UN that have a section that deal with um, the treatment of skeletal remains in human rights uh, uh, or mass or genocide cases. Yes, sir, I am. And do any of those documents recommend sawing open the skull? No, sir, not to my knowledge. Foundation of the document. Overall, who's answered the question? Okay. No further questions. Cross examination.
Good afternoon, Dr. Warren. Good afternoon. You're the gentleman who, uh, the witness who did the quick time video, correct? Correct, PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. And that was done uh, on some, on Photoshop? Objection beyond the scope. Sustain. Now, you're not a medical doctor. No, sir. In fact, you uh, are not a forensic pathologist. That's correct. Okay. And you can't testify intelligently as to what a forensic pathologist should or should not do. That's correct. Okay. But you're going to do so here today. No, I'm and testifying. Argumentative move to strike. Oh, well, he can answer the question if he can. I'm testifying to what a competent forensic anthropologist would do. Uh, in my opinion, this was an anthropological case. Okay. Thank you for clearing that up, sir. Mm -hmm. So you can't talk about what a forensic pathologist with the experience of Werner Spitz, Dr. Werner Spitz, should or should not do at, as he is conducting an autopsy. Objection, Cape and violation. Sustained. And what your testimony is here today has to, is basically limited to what a forensic anthropologist would do. True. Okay. Uh, you mentioned some document about um, the Minnesota, uh, what are these Protocol. Minnesota papers? Minnesota Protocol. Okay. One of the UN documents for human rights. And that that's for anthropologists? Anthrop Anthropologists. Anthropologists. Uh, the, the human rights teams are usually multidisciplinary, so there may be forensic pathologists, forensic uh, anthropologists, uh, forensic archaeologists. So those protocols are written for whoever's doing those skeletal examinations. And you're not aware or familiar with the National Association of Medical Examiners autopsy protocols, are you? Somewhat, somewhat familiar with those, yes. Okay. And I meant I heard you testify about a um, I know Mr. Ashton had trouble with the word, but I heard Magnum was the last. <laughs> okay. Okay. What is the hole in, the, in the skull? We'll call it the large hole. Okay. Um, why do you look in there? You you peer in there under under a light. Okay. But why? Why? What's the big deal? Uh, well, you're looking for any kind of pathological lesions, traumatic injuries, uh, any kind of staining, anything that's taphonomic, anything that would lend anything to the investigation. And that would include um, a discoloration at the base of the skull by the middle ear that would be an indication of suffocation. Objection, in fact, which is not in evidence. Staying. Judge, we're talking about what can or cannot be seen. Uh, there are a number of pathological reasons why one would look inside of a skull, correct? Uh, during autopsy? Yes. Uh, yes, certainly. Okay. And if a pathologist finds that it is the best way to look at those and to create pathological findings or to look at for, for their pathological findings to open the skull up, that of course should be left up to that professional in that field. Any of those procedures I think would be um, up to the individual investigator that's doing that, whether they're a pathologist or anthropologist. Um, you, you know, the recommendation would be to follow the best practices of your discipline. Now, you testified during uh, direct examination about a skeletal inspection mm -hmm. as an anthropologist, correct? Mm -hmm. And you did that in this case. Uh, skeletal examination. Seems the scope. That we doesn't. Approach? He, he, sustained. May we approach, Judge, as you may. Mr. Ashton, of course. Objection sustained. Next question. Sir, and you did not do uh, the cranial washes in this case? No, sir. And uh, as part of your job, you uh, reviewed the autopsy notes, autopsy report? Uh, 
again, an autopsy was not done in this case. This was a bone, a bone case, so it was a skeletal examination. Um, and so I really didn't review anything prior to Dr. Schultz and myself doing the examination uh, of, of the remains. My question was, I, I'm not asking if you did an autopsy. Mm -hmm. I'm asking if you reviewed the 23-page autopsy report by Dr. Jan Garavaglia. No, I don't think I've ever seen it. You've never reviewed her her autopsy report? No. How about the report of Dr. Bruce Goldberger? I haven't read that. You haven't read the autopsy report? Okay. And asked an answer. I, I wasn't finished with my question. I finished the question. I apologize. You haven't reviewed the autopsy report or toxicological report at all in this case in order to render any of your opinions. Now the toxicology an answer indicated you didn't review them. Mm -hmm. Sister Bang. If I may have just a moment of C5. You minutes. may. Thank you, sir. You may be excused.